Numbers chapter 3 This is the account of the family of Aaron and Moses at the time the Lord spoke to Moses at Mount Sinai. The names of the sons of Aaron were Nadab the firstborn, and Abihu, Eleazar, and Ithamar. Those were the names of Aaron's sons, the anointed priests, who were ordained to serve as priests. Nadab and Abihu, however, died before the Lord when they made an offering with unauthorized fire before him in the desert of Sinai. They had no sons, so Eleazar and Ithamar served as priests during the lifetime of their father Aaron. The Lord said to Moses, Bring the tribe of Levi and present them to Aaron the priest to assist him. They are to perform duties for him and for the whole community at the tent of meeting by doing the work of the tabernacle. They are to take care of all the furnishings of the tent of meeting, fulfilling the obligations of the Israelites by doing the work of the tabernacle. Give the Levites to Aaron and his sons. They are the Israelites who are to be given wholly to him. Appoint Aaron and his sons to serve as priests. Anyone else who approaches the sanctuary is to be put to death. The Lord also said to Moses, I have taken the Levites from among the Israelites in place of the first male offspring of every Israelite woman. The Levites are mine, for all the firstborn are mine. When I struck down all the firstborn in Egypt, I set apart for myself every firstborn in Israel, whether human or animal. They are to be mine. I am the Lord. The Lord said to Moses in the desert of Sinai, Count the Levites by their families and clans. Count every male a month old or more. So Moses counted them as he was commanded by the word of the Lord. These were the names of the sons of Levi, Gershon, Kohath, and Merari. These were the names of the Gershonite clans, Libni and Shimei. The Kohathite clans, Amram, Itza, Hebron, and Aziel. The Merarite clans, Malai and Mushai. These were the Levite clans according to their families. To Gershon belonged the clans of the Libnites and Shimeites. These were the Gershonite clans. The number of all the males a month old or more who were counted was 7,500. The Gershonite clans were to camp on the west behind the tabernacle. The leader of the families of the Gershonites was Eliasaph, son of Lael. At the tent of meeting, the Gershonites were responsible for the care of the tabernacle and tent, its coverings, the curtain at the entrance to the tent of meeting, the curtains of the courtyard, the curtain at the entrance to the courtyard surrounding the tabernacle and altar, and the ropes, and everything related to their use. To Kohath belonged the clans of the Amramites, Isarites, Hebronites, and Azielites. These were the Kohathite clans. The number of all the males a month old or more was 8,600. The Kohathites were responsible for the care of the sanctuary. The Kohathite clans were to camp on the south side of the tabernacle. The leader of the families of the Kohathite clans was Eliaphan, son of Aziel. They were responsible for the care of the ark, the table, the lampstand, the altars, the articles of the sanctuary used in ministering, the curtain, and everything related to their use. The chief leader of the Levites was Eleazar, son of Aaron the priest. He was appointed over those who were responsible for the care of the sanctuary. To Merari belonged the clans of the Marlites and the Mushites. These were the Merarite clans. The number of all the males a month old or more who were counted was 6,200. The leader of the families of the Merarite clans was Zuriel, son of Abihael. They were to camp on the north side of the tabernacle. The Merarites were appointed to take care of the frames of the tabernacle, its crossbars, posts, bases, all its equipment, and everything related to their use, as well as the posts of the surrounding courtyard with their bases, tent pegs, and ropes. 
Moses and Aaron and his sons were to camp to the east of the tabernacle, towards the sunrise, in front of the tent of meeting. They were responsible for the care of the sanctuary on behalf of the Israelites. Anyone else who approached the sanctuary was to be put to death. The total number of Levites counted at the Lord's command by Moses and Aaron according to their clans, including every male a month old or more, was twenty-two thousand. The Lord said to Moses, Count all the firstborn Israelite males who are a month old or more, and make a list of their names. Take the Levites for me in place of all the firstborn of the Israelites, and the livestock of the Levites in place of all the firstborn of the livestock of the Israelites. I am the Lord. So Moses counted all the firstborn of the Israelites as the Lord commanded him. The total number of firstborn males a month old or more listed by name was 22,273. The Lord also said to Moses, Take the Levites in place of all the firstborn of Israel, and the livestock of the Levites in place of their livestock. The Levites are to be mine. I am the Lord. To redeem the 273 firstborn Israelites who exceed the number of the Levites, collect five shekels for each one, according to the sanctuary shekel, which weighs twenty giras. Give the money for the redemption of the additional Israelites to Aaron and his sons. So Moses collected the redemption money from those who exceeded the number redeemed by the Levites. From the firstborn of the Israelites he collected silver weighing 1,365 shekels, according to the sanctuary shekel. Moses gave the redemption money to Aaron and his sons, as he was commanded by the word of the Lord. Numbers chapter 4 The Lord said to Moses and Aaron, Take a census of the Kohathite branch of the Levites by their clans and families. Count all the men from thirty to fifty years of age who come to serve in the work at the Tent of Meeting. This is the work of the Kohathites at the Tent of Meeting, the care of the most holy things. When the camp is to move, Aaron and his sons are to go in and take down the shielding curtain and put it over the Ark of the Covenant Law. Then they are to cover the curtain with durable leather, spread a cloth of solid blue over that, and put the poles in place. Over the table of the presence they are to spread a blue cloth and put on it the plates, dishes and bowls and the jars for drink offerings. The bread that is continually there is to remain on it. They are to spread a scarlet cloth over them, cover that with durable leather, and put the poles in place. They are to take a blue cloth and cover the lampstand that is for light together with its lamps, its wick trimmers and trays, and all its jars for the oil used to supply it. Then they are to wrap it and all its accessories in a covering of durable leather and put it on a carrying frame. Over the gold altar, they are to spread a blue cloth and cover that with durable leather and put the poles in place. They are to take all the articles used for ministering in the sanctuary, wrap them in a blue cloth, cover that with durable leather and put them on a carrying frame. They are to remove the ashes from the bronze altar and spread a purple cloth over it. Then they are to place on it all the utensils used for ministering at the altar including the firepans, meat forks, shovels, and sprinkling bowls. Over it they are to spread a covering of durable leather and put the poles in place. After Aaron and his sons have finished covering the holy furnishings and all the holy articles, and when the camp is ready to move, only then are the Kohathites to come and do the carrying. But they must not touch the holy things or they will die. The Kohathites are to carry those things that are in the tent of meeting. Eleazar, son of Aaron the priest, is to have charge of the oil for the light, the fragrant incense, the regular grain offering, and the anointing oil. He is to be in charge of the entire tabernacle and everything in it, 
including its holy furnishings and articles. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron, See that the Kohathite tribal clans are not destroyed from among the Levites, so that they may live and not die when they come near the most holy things. Do this for them. Aaron and his sons are to go into the sanctuary and assign to each man his work and what he is to carry. But the Kohathites must not go in to look at the holy things, even for a moment, or they will die. The Lord said to Moses, Take a census also of the Gershonites by their families and clans. Count all the men from thirty to fifty years of age who come to serve in the work at the tent of meeting. This is the service of the Gershonite clans in their carrying and their other work. They are to carry the curtains of the tabernacle, that is, the tent of meeting, its covering and its outer covering of durable leather, the curtains for the entrance to the tent of meeting, the curtains of the courtyard surrounding the tabernacle and altar, the curtain for the entrance to the courtyard, the ropes and all the equipment used in the service of the tent. The Gershonites are to do all that needs to be done with these things. All their service, whether carrying or doing other work, is to be done under the direction of Aaron and his sons. You shall assign to them as their responsibility all they are to carry. This is the service of the Gershonite clans at the tent of meeting. Their duties are to be under the direction of Ithamar, son of Aaron, the priest. Count the Morayrites by their clans and families. Count all the men from thirty to fifty years of age who come to serve in the work at the tent of meeting. As part of all their service at the tent, they are to carry the frames of the tabernacle, its crossbars, posts and bases, as well as the posts of the surrounding courtyard with their bases, tent pegs, ropes, all their equipment and everything related to their use. Assign to each man the specific things he is to carry. This is the service of the Morayrite clans as they work at the tent of meeting, under the direction of Ithamar, son of Aaron, the priest. Moses, Aaron, and the leaders of the community counted the Kohathites by their clans and families. All the men from thirty to fifty years of age who came to serve in the work at the tent of meeting, counted by clans, were two thousand seven hundred and fifty. This was the total of all those in the Kohathite clans who served at the tent of meeting. Moses and Aaron counted them according to the Lord's command through Moses. The Gershonites were counted by their clans and families. All the men from thirty to fifty years of age who came to serve in the work at the tent of meeting, counted by their clans and families, were two thousand six hundred and thirty. This was the total of those in the Gershonite clans who served at the tent of meeting. Moses and Aaron counted them according to the Lord's command. The Morayrites were counted by their clans and families. All the men from thirty to fifty years of age who came to serve in the work at the tent of meeting, counted by their clans, were three thousand two hundred. This was the total of those in the Morayrite clans. Moses and Aaron counted them according to the Lord's command through Moses. So Moses, Aaron, and the leaders of Israel counted all the Levites by their clans and families. All the men from thirty to fifty years of age who came to do the work of serving and carrying the tent of meeting numbered eight thousand five hundred and eighty. At the Lord's command through Moses, each was assigned his work and told what to carry. Thus they were counted as the Lord commanded Moses. Numbers chapter 5 The Lord said to Moses, Command the Israelites to send away from the camp anyone who has a defiling skin disease or a discharge of any kind, or who is ceremonially unclean because of a dead body. Send away male and female alike. Send them outside the camp, so that they will not defile their camp where I dwell among them. The Israelites did so. They sent them outside the camp. They did just as the Lord had instructed Moses. The Lord said to Moses, 
Say to the Israelites, Any man or woman who wrongs another in any way, and so is unfaithful to the Lord, is guilty and must confess the sin they have committed. They must make full restitution for the wrong they have done, add a fifth of the value to it and give it all to the person they have wronged. But if that person has no close relative to whom restitution could be made for the wrong, the restitution belongs to the Lord and must be given to the priest, along with the ram with which atonement is made for the wrongdoer. All the sacred contributions the Israelites bring to a priest will belong to him. Sacred things belong to their owners, but what they give to the priest will belong to the priest. Then the Lord said to Moses, Speak to the Israelites and say to them, If a man's wife goes astray and is unfaithful to him so that another man has sexual relations with her, and this is hidden from her husband, and her impurity is undetected, since there is no witness against her and she has not been caught in the act, and if feelings of jealousy come over her husband, and he suspects his wife and she is impure, or if he is jealous and suspects her, even though she is not impure, then he is to take his wife to the priest. He must also take an offering of a tenth of an ephah, of barley flour, on her behalf. He must not pour olive oil on it, or put incense on it, because it is a grain offering for jealousy, a reminder offering to draw attention to wrongdoing. The priest shall bring her and make her stand before the Lord. Then he shall take some holy water in a clay jar and put some dust from the tabernacle floor into the water. After the priest has made the woman stand before the Lord, he shall loosen her hair and place in her hands the reminder offering the grain offering for jealousy, while he himself holds the bitter water that brings a curse. Then the priest shall put the woman under oath and say to her, If no other man has had sexual relations with you, and you have not gone astray and become impure while married to your husband, may this bitter water that brings a curse not harm you. But if you have gone astray while married to your husband, and you have made yourself impure by having sexual relations with a man other than your husband, here the priest is to put the woman under this curse. May the Lord cause you to become a curse among your people when he makes your womb miscarry and your abdomen swell. May this water that brings a curse enter your body so that your abdomen swells or your womb miscarries. Then the woman is to say, Amen so be it. The priest is to write these curses on a scroll and then wash them off into the bitter water. He shall make the woman drink the bitter water that brings a curse, and this water that brings a curse and causes bitter suffering will enter her. The priest is to take from her hands the grain offering for jealousy, wave it before the Lord and bring it to the altar. The priest is then to take a handful of the grain offering as a memorial offering and burn it on the altar. After that, he is to make the woman drink the water. If she has made herself impure and been unfaithful to her husband, this will be the result. When she is made to drink the water that brings a curse and causes bitter suffering, it will enter her her abdomen will swell, and her womb will miscarry, and she will become a curse. If, however, the woman has not made herself impure but is clean, she will be cleared of guilt and will be able to have children. This, then, is the law of jealousy, when a woman goes astray and makes herself impure while married to her husband, or when feelings of jealousy come over a man because he suspects his wife. The priest is to make her stand before the Lord and is to apply this entire law to her. The husband will be innocent of any wrongdoing, but the woman will bear the consequences of her sin. Mark chapter 6 
Jesus left there and went to his hometown accompanied by his disciples. When the Sabbath came, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were amazed. Where did this man get these things? they asked. What's this wisdom that has been given him? What are these remarkable miracles he's performing? Isn't this the carpenter? Isn't this Mary's son and the brother of James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon? Aren't his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor, except in his own town, among his relatives and in his own home. He couldn't do any miracles there, except lay hands on a few people who were ill and heal them. He was amazed at their lack of faith. Then Jesus went around teaching from village to village. Calling the twelve to him, he began to send them out two by two and gave them authority over impure spirits. These were his instructions. Take nothing for the journey except a staff. No bread, no bag, no money in your belts. Wear sandals, but not an extra shirt. Whenever you enter a house, stay there until you leave that town. And if any place will not welcome you or listen to you, leave that place and shake the dust off your feet as a testimony against them. They went out and preached that people should repent. They drove out many demons and anointed with oil many people who were ill and healed them. King Herod heard about this, for Jesus' name had become well known. Some were saying, John the Baptist has been raised from the dead, and that is why miraculous powers are at work in him. Others said, He is Elijah. And still others claimed, He is a prophet, like one of the prophets of long ago. But when Herod heard this, he said, John, whom I beheaded, has been raised from the dead. For Herod himself had given orders to have John arrested, and he had him bound and put in prison. He did this because of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, whom he had married. For John had been saying to Herod, It is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. So Herodias nursed a grudge against John and wanted to kill him. But she was not able to because Herod feared John and protected him, knowing him to be a righteous and holy man. When Herod heard John, he was greatly puzzled, yet he liked to listen to him. Finally, the opportune time came. On his birthday, Herod gave a banquet for his high officials and military commanders and the leading men of Galilee. When the daughter of Herodias came in and danced, she pleased Herod and his dinner guests. The king said to the girl, Ask me for anything you want, and I'll give it to you. And he promised her with an oath, Whatever you ask, I will give you up to half my kingdom. She went out and said to her mother, What shall I ask for? The head of John the Baptist, she answered. At once, the girl hurried into the king with a request. I want you to give me, right now, the head of John the Baptist on a dish. The king was greatly distressed, but because of his oaths and his dinner guests, he did not want to refuse her. So he immediately sent an executioner with orders to bring John's head. The man went, beheaded John in the prison, and brought back his head on a dish. He presented it to the girl, and she gave it to her mother. On hearing of this, John's disciples came and took his body and laid it in a tomb. The apostles gathered round Jesus and reported to him all they had done and taught. Then, because so many people were coming and going, that they did not even have a chance to eat, he said to them, Come with me by yourselves to a quiet place and get some rest. So they went away by themselves in a boat to a solitary place. But many who saw them leaving recognized them and ran on foot from all the towns and got there ahead of them. When Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. So he began teaching them many things. By this time, it was late in the day, so his disciples came to him. This is a remote place, they said, and it's already very late. Send the people away so that they can go to the surrounding countryside and villages and buy themselves something to eat. But he answered, You give them something to eat. They said to him, 
That would take more than half a year's wages. Are we to go and spend that much on bread and give it to them to eat? How many loaves do you have? he asked. Go and see. When they found out, they said, Five and two fish. Then Jesus told them to make all the people sit down in groups on the green grass. So they sat down in groups of hundreds and fifties. Taking the five loaves and the two fish and looking up to heaven, he gave thanks and broke the loaves. Then he gave them to his disciples to distribute to the people. He also divided the two fish among them all. They all ate and were satisfied, and the disciples picked up twelve basketfuls of broken pieces of bread and fish. The number of the men who had eaten was five thousand. Immediately, Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to Bethsaida, while he dismissed the crowd. After leaving them, he went up on a mountainside to pray. Later that night, the boat was in the middle of the lake, and he was alone on land. He saw the disciples straining at the oars because the wind was against them. Shortly before dawn, he went out to them, walking on the lake. He was about to pass by them, but when they saw him walking on the lake, they thought he was a ghost. They cried out because they all saw him and were terrified. Immediately he spoke to them and said, Take courage, it is I. Don't be afraid. Then he climbed into the boat with them and the wind died down. They were completely amazed, for they had not understood about the loaves. Their hearts were hardened. When they had crossed over, they landed at Gennesaret and anchored there. As soon as they got out of the boat, people recognized Jesus. They ran throughout that whole region and carried those who were ill on mats to wherever they heard he was. And wherever he went, into villages, towns, or countryside, they placed those who were ill in the marketplaces. They begged him to let them touch even the edge of his cloak, and all who touched it were healed. Psalm 48 Great is the Lord, and most worthy of praise, in the city of our God, his holy mountain. Beautiful in its loftiness, the joy of the whole earth, like the heights of Zavon, is Mount Zion, the city of the great king. God is in her citadels. He has shown himself to be her fortress. When the kings joined forces, when they advanced together, they saw her and were astounded. They fled in terror. Trembling seized them there, pain like that of a woman in labor. You destroyed them like ships of Tarshish, shattered by an east wind. As we have heard, so we have seen, in the city of the Lord Almighty, in the city of our God, God makes her secure forever. Within your temple, O God, we meditate on your unfailing love. Like your name, O God, your praise reaches to the ends of the earth. Your right hand is filled with righteousness. Mount Zion rejoices. The villages of Judah are glad because of your judgments. Walk about Zion, go around her, count her towers, consider well her ramparts, view her citadels that you may tell of them to the next generation. For this God is our God for ever and ever. He will be our guide, even to the end. Proverbs chapter 17 Better a dry crust with peace and quiet than a house full of feasting with strife. A prudent servant will rule over a disgraceful son and will share the inheritance as one of the family. The crucible for silver and the furnace for gold, but the Lord tests the heart. A wicked person listens to deceitful lips. A liar pays attention to a destructive tongue. Whoever mocks the poor shows contempt for their maker. Whoever gloats over disaster will not go unpunished. Children's children are a crown to the aged, and parents are the pride of their children. Eloquent lips are unsuited to a godless fool. How much worse lying lips 
to a ruler. A bribe is seen as a charm by the one who gives it. They think success will come at every turn. Whoever would foster love covers over an offence, but whoever repeats the matter separates close friends. A rebuke impresses a discerning person, more than a hundred lashes a fool. Evildoers foster rebellion against God. The messenger of death will be sent against them. Better to meet a bear robbed of her cubs than a fool bent on folly. Evil will never leave the house of one who pays back evil for good. Starting a quarrel is like breaching a dam. So drop the matter before a dispute breaks out. Acquitting the guilty and condemning the innocent, the Lord detests them both. Why should fools have money in hand to buy wisdom when they are not able to understand it? A friend loves at all times, and a brother is born for a time of adversity. One who has no sense shakes hands in pledge and puts up security for a neighbour. Whoever loves a quarrel loves sin. Whoever builds a high gate invites destruction. One whose heart is corrupt does not prosper. One whose tongue is perverse falls into trouble. To have a fool for a child brings grief. There is no joy for the parent of a godless fool. A cheerful heart is good medicine, but a crushed spirit dries up the bones. The wicked accept bribes in secret to pervert the course of justice. A discerning person keeps wisdom in view, but a fool's eyes wander to the ends of the earth. A foolish son brings grief to his father and bitterness to the mother who bore him. If imposing a fine on the innocent is not good, surely to flog honest officials is not right. The one who has knowledge uses words with restraint, and whoever has understanding is even-tempered. Even fools are thought wise if they keep silent, and discerning if they hold their tongues.